Welcome to the Steve Stein Guitar Podcast, brought to you by GuitarZoom.com. If you want to improve your guitar playing, keep listening. If you want to improve even faster, go to GuitarZoom.com, where you'll find all of Steve's premium courses, masterclasses, and memberships that'll help you quickly and easily improve your playing. Now, here's your host, Steve Stein. Can you hear me okay, Dan? I can, Steve. Awesome. I can hear you too. Great. <laughs> it's so good to see you, my friend. It's hey, good to see you too. Thanks for being here for another sec- uh, session that we're doing on the creative, um, creative soloing. Yeah. You're awesome, Steve. And so are you, Dan. Nah, I'm just, I, my, I tell my wife, she keeps me around just to open jars and squash bugs. <laughs> That's all I do around here. <clears throat> Uh, hey guys, thank you for being here. Really appreciate you joining us for another creative soloing workshop. Um, if you'd like to be notified of the next one, just subscribe and hit the notification button. You'll get a notification. Also, if you missed any of the previous ones, they'll be available for you in a nice tidy playlist right there on the YouTube channel, either guitar zoom channel or the YouTube channel. If you're watching this on Facebook or Instagram or some other platform, um, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. Also, there's a podcast. Uh, you can check that out at Steve Stein Guitar Podcast. So wherever you are, thank you for being with us. We really appreciate it. Today, we're talking about picking secrets for effective soloing. And um, if you want to learn how to do that, stick with us. If you want to learn how to do it even faster, you can check out Steve's new course. It's called Creative Soloing by Steve Stein, and it's available at guitarzoom.com. I am totally stoked about this, man, because I picking is like one of those things that people love to talk about all kinds of terms and everything. And like, well, once you learn how to do it, it's kind of this intuitive thing, but breaking it down into something people can understand is very effective and helpful. So I'm looking forward to this. Okay, perfect. Yeah. You know, the, the thing about picking is that we, we really have kind of two different worlds that we do when we're, when we're playing, we either pick things or we use what's called legato, which is hammer-ons and pull-offs. And for most players, you kind of shift back and forth between those two worlds. Uh, They work kind of hand-in-hand with each other. Picking tends to make things sound a bit more staccato. And legato tends to make things sound a bit more like connected and smooth. But oftentimes you kind of need both of them. So, you know, one thing I'm going to tell you, and then we'll get into these various techniques, is that oftentimes we we watch a video or, you know, get the tab for something or whatever, and the the video or the tab will tell us, maybe we're learning a song, right? Or maybe we're learning a lick by somebody that we we like. Um, and And it tells us to play it a certain way, to pick this or to hammer this or something like that. And it's okay to to learn it that way, all right? But what I always want to remind people is that the most important thing, especially when you're trying to be creative, is that you've got to find what works best for you. Um, Just because the particular pair of shoes fits somebody else doesn't mean they're going to fit you. And so, Mm. um, you know, sometimes it's it's necessary. Sometimes you need to pick it a certain way or you need to do a legato thing a certain way. Sometimes it is, but oftentimes it's not. You have to figure out what's the best way for you. So I never really wanted to lump myself into the category that everything is picked. Like every note I play is picked or everything is legato. You know, it seemed like I grew up in the 80s and it seemed like there was a period of time where it was uncool to use any legato. Like everything was supposed to be picked. And now you've got a whole host of these new guitar players out there that are just absolutely amazing. Um, You know, Nick Johnston to... Guthrie to all these players out there that are just amazing that use combinations of all these things, which I'm so glad to see again. So I just want you to understand as we're talking about these things, I'm going to show you the techniques, but ultimately, just like anything else you learn from me, I'm going to encourage you to figure out which way works best. Try the way I'm doing it. And if that doesn't really seem like it's going to work, try another way and see if that works. Okay. 
So, um, so when we're learning these things, the first thing that we usually learn, of course, is down picking. And then we get into this really bad habit of just down picking everything. <laughs> Now, down picking is really important, but it's limited. It's very raw and aggressive because the wrist has to come back up every time to pick down and it limits your, your speed, no doubt about it, but it also makes things a bit more aggressive in nature when you play. And what alternate picking does is it gives you the ability of being able to utilize the space in between those downs by picking it up. Which obviously can speed things up, no doubt about it, but you can also notice that I work, I'm not working as hard because I'm able to use the efficiency of that upstrum in between those downs. So I'm not having to jump over and then pick down and jump over and pick down. Now, in saying that, that doesn't mean that sometimes we don't just down pick. We do. There's a lot of times where we're... where we want that down pick tone, okay? So, obviously, the first kind of picking technique is down picking. Mm -hmm. The second kind of picking is alternate picking, which is down up picking. Now, down up picking can occur at any point in time, okay? Sometimes I might combine down pick, or excuse me, alternate picking with legato. So let's say I was doing something like this, and this is really important to kind of understand, and again, you need to apply it, but let's say I was doing something where I'm going like this. So on the fifth string and the fourth string, I'm playing five, seven, five, seven, and I'm picking them alternate, so I'm going down, up, down, up. Okay, now the first pick is a down and then followed by the up. The next pick is a down followed by the up. Now let's say I wanted to, again, in a realistic situation, you'd need to figure this out, but let's say on the, on the fifth string, I wanted to do that as a hammer on. So I wanna go hammer, and then I'm gonna pick the next two. So I'm going hammer, okay? I have to understand that where that hammer-on is occurring is where the alternate pick, the upstroke, would have been occurring. So I'm playing down, and then I'm doing the hammer-on, and while I'm doing the hammer-on, I'm bringing my hand back up so I'm ready for the next down pick. Because I would have played down, up, down, up. But because I'm doing that legato, I'm, I'm hammering this one. I'm not going to start the next string on an up and then a down because if I do, when I start all over again, I'm now going to be on an upstrum. Mm. That's now, not that's the worst thing in the world, but the problem is, is I'm throwing more wrenches into what I'm trying to create here and there's less symmetry happening because the pick is now undetermined which, which direction it's going to be going. So if I do that hammer on... <laughs> You'll notice I'm still trying to keep the motion of that alternate picking. And so it takes out the guesswork of which way I'm picking. Right. Now that's a very simple example, but you're going to find that as you start playing things, that sometimes you're going to get into a situation where when you're picking a particular pattern, instead of just picking them all down, maybe you want to use some alternate picking in there. And when you create that pattern, sometimes you're going to have to rethink the way you're down in alternate picking or down up picking to make sure that you're creating a pattern that is repeatable in some aspect. Because oftentimes, just like we were talking about escape routes and how the fingers sometimes get twisted up because they're not sure what to do. Well, when you're playing picking and legato, it's just as important to have a, an understanding and confidence in your ability to be able to do those things and allow your hand to execute freely because sometimes we spend so much time thinking about what the fretting hand is doing that we don't really think about what the picking hand is doing. We just assume it's going to pick when it's supposed to pick. And it might, but it might not be picking the most efficient way. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Makes okay. Of sense. Okay. So, you know, if I'm doing something logically like this, well, that's pretty easy because there's two notes on each string. So I'm doing down, up, down, up. But if I was going... Well, that's different. Now, all of a sudden, I'm twisting in and out of strings and things like that. So there's a whole host of different things going on inside a lick like that. There's legato. There's alternate picking. OK, 
okay? And, and I'll break down that lick in just a second so you can see it all actually in action. But there's another thing I want to explain to you before that. If you're enjoying this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, go to guitarzoom.com and consider becoming a premium member. There are three memberships to choose from. VIP, which gives you instant access to a library of short but powerful courses as well as new bite-sized lessons each month. There's also Play Songs that gives you step-by-step -step lessons so you can learn to play your favorite songs fast. And finally, there's Masterclass, university-level training on everything from soloing to music theory, from blues to home recording. For more info about these memberships and all the premium courses available to you, go to guitarzoom.com. Now back to the podcast. Um, there's what we call inside and outside picking. Okay. Now inside picking, let's say we went to the seventh fret of the fourth and third strings. And I, again, you could use two different fingers, one finger, whatever. That isn't really the point. If you go to pick those two notes, you could pick them down. But again, you've got to trail back up. You've got to bring that wrist back up to start your down pick again. So this is an example where it's okay to pick them down. Nothing wrong with that at, at all. Um, but depending on where I'm coming from, where I'm going to, there's a couple of other options I have for picking. I might alternate pick, as we just talked about. But if I start with a down and then do an up, what you'll notice is I'm, I'm on the outsides of the strings. I'm playing on the outsides of the strings, which is okay. I just want you to be aware of that because it feels drastically different than playing on what we call the insides, which let's just stay on the outside for a second. So we're playing down, up, we're sitting on the outsides of those strings. Now, if I was to start with an up strum, you'll notice that puts me on the insides of the strings. I'm sitting in between, in between those two strings. So I do an up and a down which might be faster, but it gives you less room. It's like being in a really small closet, right? There's not much room there. Where on the outside, I've got more space. Now, neither one is better or worse. It's just you need to be aware of that when you're playing. So if I was playing a lick and I came down in that lick, I'm winding up on the outsides. That feels okay to me, okay? If I was coming from this note, just this five right here and went into it, well, now I'm on the insides. Because I went down, up, down. Now, my point is, is neither one is better or worse than each other, but I'm aware of it. I've mm. practiced being on the outsides of the strings. I've practiced being on the insides of the strings. So when I'm improvising and I'm creatively moving around the fretboard and I get there, in whatever circumstance that happens, and I wind up on the insides, it doesn't feel awkward to me. Or if I wind up on the outsides of the strings, it doesn't feel awkward to me. So my brain doesn't glitch for a second because it feels weird. I'm okay with either one of those things because I've practiced them. Totally makes sense. Okay. So we've got down picking, we've got alternate picking, we've got inside and outside picking. And then the last one I want to explain to you is what's called economy picking. Now, economy picking is like a cross between down picking and alternate picking. And we use uh, economy picking a lot when we tend to do two on two patterns or arpeggios, and those may be integrated into something else that we're already doing. Okay, so let me explain it to you. So let's say I was playing pentatonic again, and I'm gonna play five, eight, and then on the next string, I'm gonna play seven and five, and then I'm gonna end on this seven. So I'm going five, eight, seven, five, seven. Now, I could completely alternate pick that. Down, up, down, up, down. But an alternative to this is to play down, and then up, and then down, down. Or start with an up, and then play down, down, down. Because I'm, it's like a chord. At that point, I'm playing through the strings with an arpeggio. So it might m make more sense for me to play all downs to slice through those strings as opposed to 
and trying to alternate pick those. See, I couldn't do that if I was alternate picking. But I can with economy picking. Economy picking, think of economy picking as it's economical. Sometimes you're alternate picking, sometimes you're just down picking, sometimes you're just up picking, right? Depending on the circumstance. And this is a very popular technique, especially nowadays, because a lot of players are playing and all of a sudden they'll drop into either 2-1-2 two, two patterns as we've discussed before in these workshops or an arpeggiated idea, intervallic playing. Remember, we've talked about all those things in our workshops. And instead of, again, thinking that everything needs to be a certain way, you're, you're more intuitively thinking as I'm playing right there, I roll into this alt or this economy picking where I'm pushing through my downs and then here I do an up and then downs and up. Do you kind of see how that works? Yeah. So the 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 point is is oftentimes with with players where you know it's hard to maybe even impossible to think about all these things at the same time. So in order to really get to a place of comfort and control, this absolute place or you know this authentic place, whatever we want to call it, we want to be aware of all of the hiccups or the snares that happen along the way. You know, it's not just memorizing something on the fretboard, and that's what this whole thing has been about. Memorizing uses a different part of your brain than applying and practicing and exploring. And the more hiccups I can extract and remove and throw away from the way I move around the fretboard and the things that I'm trying to do, the more everything's just happening naturally, the less mistakes I'm going to make. Right. Right. The more I can focus on what this thing we call music, because I'm not thinking about whether I'm down picking or alternate picking, it's all happening naturally. That doesn't mean it's always happened naturally. Right. I practice all of these different things, but I just want to make you aware that these are different kinds of things. So if we looked at this lick now, that lick that I was doing, here's what I'm doing is I'm just, again, real quick here, I'm just doing a pull off from eight to five, and then I'm playing this blues note, which we've talked about, eight to five, but I'm, I'm economy picking that. I'm pressing down through both of those. You see that? So I'm pushing my pick through both those strings. I'm not trying to alternate pick that. So I'm doing down with a pull off. That's where my up would go, which I'm skipping. And then I'm pushing through twice with those downs. So I'm getting two strings for the price of one pick, you see? Well, the next logical pick motion would be an upstroke. So I go back to that eight, pick that up, do two pull-offs there. Now I'm on the outsides, down, up, down. So I'm playing on the outsides of that string. See that? And then I'm going back to that five. But those are all things I need to be aware of to be able to actually execute this. If every time I go to play that, my pick is backwards, it's not going to feel right. So how are you determining, um, like, your picking strategy? Like, you know, you just showed us that. How, how are you, are you just it's, going on feeling? Yeah. Or what? Well, again, I... I don't know that this is going to exactly answer your question, but as I've always tried to explain, improvisation isn't really improvisation. Improvisation is regurgitation of ideas of things that you've done before. That's you right. just don't know in what order, in, in what color they're going to occur in this environment, right? But it's not like, you know, you, you give a guitar to a baby on a deserted island and they go, blah, 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 and then, you know, and all this stuff starts happening. Everything is something that you've done at some point, right? You've, you've cultivated. Right. You just don't know how it's going to come out. You don't know in what order it's going to come out. And that's the element of improvisation. But the more you take out all of these technical constructs, if you will, of picking and things like that and legato and things, 
And the more you start understanding about the way you play, these are the things that will naturally start coming out. Like I couldn't tell you where, like where that lick would have come from, right? But I know that when I go to play it, I'm not going to pick all of it. Some of it's going to be legato. It's just, that's the way I play. It doesn't matter if, you know, person X over here plays it and they pick everything. That's great. That's just not the way I execute it. But I know every time I go to play it, my execution is going to be the same every single time. You see? Yeah. So in, in kind of connecting to the last thing that we did, which was the escape route, to get into that effectively, I really want to wind up on a down pick to be able to execute that properly. Am I aware of that when I'm playing? Yeah, but I'm not really conscious of it, right? But I know if I go into that, if I wind up on that, if if I wind up on a down pick here, that lick will probably come out. Right. If I wind up on an up pick, I can't say that it will or won't. You see? Yeah. So that's why intuition and exploration and creativity is just so important and getting to know the way you play. Like not just, you know, lick number 17 and lick number 24, not that, but the connectivity of all of these things as they're happening. And I just totally want everybody sense. to understand that this is a lifelong project. Like, you know, this isn't just strumming a GC and D chord and then you're done, right? That's, that's a whole other realm of thought. So in order to get here, you need to really start being aware of the way that you're executing things, the way that you're playing things, the way that you move. All these things we've talked about in these workshops, they're, they all work together, at least you hope so, to get to this end result. You know, I, I think of just the smallest, simplest things where when people play, you know, like if you, when you first learn how to play a scale and you do this. Right? Because you don't know that you should deaden those strings. You don't, you don't think about the fact until, you know, somebody goes, stop, and you grab those strings, right? So that's, that's what you try and get used to is understanding it's all about control. So when you play, it's all about control. You got to control. Volume went off. It's always about control. You know, that's how you execute something and make it sound authentic is because you've got that control. If you play and you're going... You've lost that control, and you've also you also have lost the ability to execute on a musical level, because everything's forced to have to be played down or whatever it might be. And again, I'm not, I'm never making fun of any of those techniques for anybody. I'm just saying you have to learn how to execute things properly. And sometimes when all we're wrapped up in is again, I'm picking on the same things how much we understand or how many lessons we've had or how many books we've read. Well, you're missing the point because that's not really what it's about. It's about your ability to execute an idea or a multitude of ideas on the, on the guitar and make them sound whatever that means to you authentic. So the more you understand about what you see and what you understand, and how you execute things, you know, you hear people always talk about like the tone is in your fingers. I don't think when people say that or your sound is in your fingers, I don't think they're just talking about the tonality of a Mesa Boogie amp. It's your fingers sound like a Mesa Boogie amp. People get confused with that. I, I've never thought of it that way. I've always thought it's about the control. It's about your ability to dig in and be dynamic or your ability to be to phrase or your ability to control those things are all transferable to any amp that you'd play, right? Some amps or some guitars or whatever might be more limiting to you. They certainly are for me, right? I mean, if I'm not in my comfort zone, it's hard to play express as expressively as I'd like to. If you give me a guitar with 13 gauge strings and the strings are this far away from the neck and put me on a clean fender channel, it's going to be awfully hard for me to be able to play in my comfort zone, right? right? But if you give me if you allow me my comfort, which I deserve, just like you deserve a nice, comfortable pair of shoes, right? I deserve the comfort of a guitar that feels good to me. And when I plug into an amp, 
you know, the, the tonality that comes out of the amp is going to be reflective of that amp. But the, the music is still coming from the way you play. So when I go to NAMM or I go do clinics or master classes or whatever it might be, that's why I love to travel with one of the guitars that I love. Plug me into whatever you got, I'm fine, right? But give me something that's comfortable for me because this feels like home to me. Right. So just again, I don't want to get too far off on a tangent, but just think about that a little bit when you're playing. So with these picking secrets, so-called secrets, you know, really what we're doing is we're just being aware of all of the capability that we have with that guitar pick in the way we're going to pick these strings. And sometimes if you get mixed up, you can always go to some legato stuff, which will get you back on track, which who knows? Maybe that's why I use legato things sometimes is because my pick goes up. Oh, I'm going to get out of here because I'm not sure what's happening. Well, that's OK. And then when I get back, it comes back in and it does its job, you see? Yes. Very cool, man. Guys, if you're just now joining us, we are um, talking about creative soloing with my good friend Steve Stein. And all of the things we've talked about in this workshop and the entire workshop series we've done for you comes from Steve's new course. It's called Creative Soloing by Steve Stein. And it's available at guitarzoom.com. All of the guitars, uh, the uh, Creative Soloing workshop series is available for you in a nice tidy playlist on the YouTube channel. If you would like to be notified of the next one that we have, please um, subscribe and click the notify button. If you would like to get the course, it's called Creative Soloing. It's available on the website at Guitar Zoom. Uh, we certainly appreciate you being here. And um, don't worry if you missed it. It's all there for you in the playlist. You can always go back and, and watch it. We've done a lot of these. Just a rundown. Uh, we've done uh, meandering. We've done one on phrasing. We've done one on intervallic soloing, dynamic contrast, creative scale patterns, technique, easy arpeggios for creative guitar solos. Chord chasing, which was one of my favorite ones of the entire entire thing. Vertical versus horizontal movement across the fretboard. Creative pentatonics using the blue note or blues note or passing tone or whatever you want to call it. Um, also escape routes, which is a very interesting concept of how to move in and out of different patterns and not get stuck and and kind of playing creatively in that aspect. And then today was all about picking. And so I think this has been an awesome series, Steve. I yeah, really appreciate you sharing your time and your talent with us. Anything else you'd like to add, my friend? No, I think that's good. Again, just breaking out of the box, just thinking a little bit differently about the way you practice and what it is that you are practicing. So, yeah, cool. Hey, thanks for being here, guys. And if you enjoyed this, please share it with somebody you think might be able to benefit. Please comment and uh, let us know what you think. Steve and I love to read those. And um, if you'd like to get the course, it's Creative Soloing by Steve Stein at GuitarZoom.com. Thank you so much for being here. We'll see you all in the next session. Steve, thanks, my friend. Yep, thank you so much, Dan. And everybody take care, stay positive, and keep practicing. I love it. See you, buddy. Bye. Next time on the Steve Stein Guitar Podcast. Now, it's easy to get lost when we start talking about this because... Again, if we if we take a step back from this whole soloing thing, when we first start learning how to solo, most of the time, we don't understand anything. So we're just landing on everything, right? Just we're just moving around inside a shape that we learn and and uh, we're just trying to make something sound musical. Then we start getting some logic to what we're doing and we start telling ourselves, okay, I'm supposed to go to this over this and that sort of thing. Which neither one of those are wrong. It's just it's all about sellability. It's all about when you play does it sound the way that you want it to sound, right? So when I talk about, you know, can you sell it? I don't mean financially. I mean, can you convince somebody that what you're doing is, is supposed to sound like it is? Hey, Steve Stein here from GuitarZoom.com. And thank you so much for listening to this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, can I ask you a favor? Please subscribe, leave a review, and share it with a friend. Your feedback means more to me than you'll ever know. And be sure to check out my YouTube channels where you'll find over 1,000 videos to help you with your guitar playing. Thanks again for listening. Stay positive, keep playing, and keep having fun. If you'd like some help with your guitar playing but you're not sure how to get started, go to guitarzoom.com and look for the Help Me Choose survey. 
By answering a few simple questions, you'll get Steve's personal recommendation of the perfect course for you. All this and more is available for you at guitarzoom.com.